That didn't sound good. You know, I, that's why I kind of lowered my voice when I said it, because I realized it as it's coming out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I am very, very happy with the cooler weather. I'm sure there's some summer people here, but I am not one. So for me, that is a joyous morning that woke up and it was cool. I protested yesterday the hot weather that it was 100 degrees and I refused to go outside at all the entire day. <laughs> um, next Sunday is going to be our um, uh, World Communion Sunday and we're going to be uh, I can't use my words today, getting our mem new members on the session, um, and we'll be doing that through Zoom. And I also want to remind you that there are some decisions for the congregation to make, um, and that information, I'm not sure if Janet left it or not, um, but if you didn't get a sheet that has some of the options, um, let me know and I can, or get a hold of Janet and we'll get you what you need, and I think that's going to be a discussion next week as well. Are there any other announcements today? All right, then our call to worship song is Breathe on Me, O Breath of God. <laughs> We grow in wisdom as our experience unfolds. We take good learning out of difficult situations, yet also find our well-met endeavors leading to unintended consequences. Too often we give in to temptation that disrupts the joyous, chaotic order of the universe. We cannot undo all our mistakes, but we can turn once more to the living presence of Jesus and find new ways to live and love each other and the earth. Do not let our hearts be fearful, but let us in silence acknowledge our sin and seek the forgiveness that restores your peace. Even as Adam and Eve faced the consequences of their sin, our God prepared a way for them still to be connected to the earth and to the living presence of God. So it is with all of us. In Christ's life, ministry, death, and resurrection, we are made able to persist, upright and strong, for our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. So today, we're going to be moving uh, straight into the sermon. I am going to be reading today's scripture passages throughout the sermon, and they're all going to come from the Message Bible, so they might sound a little different than what you're used to. At the time God made earth and heaven, before any grasses or shrubs had sprouted from the ground, God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth, nor was there anyone around to work the ground. The whole earth was watered by underground springs. 
God formed man out of dirt from the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. Man came alive, a living soul. Then God planted a, gar planted a garden in Eden in the east. He put the man he had just made into it. God made all kinds of trees grow from the ground, trees beautiful to look at and good to eat. The tree of life was in the middle of the garden, also the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there divides into four rivers. The first is Pishon. It flows through Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of this land is good. The land is also known for a sweet-scented resin and the onyx stone. The second river is named Gihon. It flows through the land of Cush. The third river is named Jebel, and it flows east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates, Genesis 2, verses 5 through 14. This passage honors the vastness of God's generosity. When God gives, God gives. Just look at how Eden is described in Genesis. A flawless land filled with beautiful gems and flowers, rivers flowing and bringing life to the trees and animals. The first people were given this place of peace and splendor, a true paradise. They were also given a purpose. Verse 15, God took the man and set him down in the Garden of Eden to work the ground and keep it in order. This gave humans a purpose a way to use their creative energy, their time, a way to do good works on behalf of God. God provided sustenance, food and water to power the body so complex in their functioning. Verses 16 and 17 say, God commanded the man, you can eat from any tree in the garden except from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from it. The moment you eat from that tree, you're dead. Genesis 2, 16 through 17. Okay, so on that one, there's a caveat. But still, God took care of that basic need that all humans have. God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a helper, a companion. So God formed from the dirt of the ground all the animals of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. The man named the cattle, named the birds of the air, named the wild animals, but he still couldn't find a suitable companion. I love animals, much to my husband's chagrin. There is not a stray dog that has come across my path that we have not ended up adopting. And I find companionship in my sweet kittens. Honestly, there are many times I'd rather be at home with my pets, but even when I don't feel like human companionship, I really need it. Mother Teresa said, the most terrible poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being unloved. God recognizes that humans have an innate need to connect with others on an intimate level. So God put the man into a deep sleep. As he slept, he removed one of his ribs and replaced it with flesh. God then used the rib that he had taken from the man to make woman and presented her to the man. Verses 21 and 22. And so the people were given each other. They were given a good place to live, to thrive. They were given a place where they could work and love. It was all so good. They had it all, yet it seems like it wasn't enough because they didn't have everything. There was that tree. Now the serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. He spoke to the woman, do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, not at all. We can eat from the trees in the garden. It's only the middle tree, and the, the, it's only the tree in the middle of the garden that God has said, "Don't eat from it, 
Don't even touch it or you'll die. The serpent told the woman, you won't die. God knows that the moment that you eat from that tree, you'll see what's really going on. You'll be just like God, knowing everything, ranging all the way from good to evil. When the woman saw that the tree looked good, like good eating and realized just what she could get out of it, she would know everything, she took and ate the fruit and gave some to her husband, and he ate as well. And immediately, the two of them did see what's really going on. This part of Genesis is one that we review every year during the season of Lent. And so as I was reading through it for this sermon, I had to stay away from the parts of it that I've already preached on because it's such a reaction to me when I read it. But it's not just being tempted and failing that temptation. See, at the heart of their action against God's command was this. They stopped seeing God as a generous creator who had already provided everything they could ever need, but as a withholder that was keeping them from having it all. The focus shifted from what they already had to what they did not yet possess. The thing is, though, they already had what they needed. Psychologist Abraham Maslow is famous for putting together a hierarchy of basic needs that describe the human quest to happiness. There are air, water, sleep, safety, food, shelter, and clothing. From our reading today, we know that God has provided all these things for Adam and Eve. If we would have read a, would have read a little further when God pronounces their judgment, after they've seen it all and they know they no longer have clothes and they find it shameful now, God even provided them with clothing. It's easy for us to look at these two and shake our heads at their ingratitude, at their short-sightedness. Most of us don't want to think of ourselves as ungrateful or ungenerous. But the fact is, we live in a material world, and we always have. Most of you probably recognize the idiom, keeping up with the Joneses. It means striving to match one's neighbors in spending and social standing. It originated with Arthur Pop Mullins keeping up with the Joneses comic strip in the New York Globe. The strip was first published in 1913 and became popular quite quickly. It ran until 1940 in the New York world and various other newspapers. It depicts the social climbing McGinnis family who struggle to keep up with their neighbors, the Joneses of the title. Now, those Joneses, they were unseen characters. They were often talked about, often complained about, often envied, but never shown in the strip. That saying, keeping up with the Joneses, has remained popular, even though the comic has long ended. And I would wager most people don't even know where it came from. And yet, it has shown up in pop culture throughout the years, in music like the song Luca Bach Texas by Waylon Jennings, and the reality television, keeping up with the Kardashians, took their name from it. There's a reason this phrase, this phrase has stayed in our mind and has woven itself into culture because we can all relate to it. It's a human condition, that wanting more. It's so easy for the line to be blurred between ambition and wanting to do more for others and improve ourselves into wanting more money, more status, more stuff. But what's even worse is it goes from wanting to feeling like we need it. We need those things to stay relevant in our lives. We need to keep up with the Joneses. But the sad thing is, 
when we focus on the, those things we don't have, our eyes cloud over. We stop seeing each other. We stop seeing each other as, God, as the way God sees us. And our hearts harden to each other, to each other's pain, to each other's struggles, because we're so focused on our own. Yet the truth that we have been talking about the last few weeks is that we are made in God's image, and God is generous and loving. There's a big to-do about showing gratitude. I don't know if you know it, but there are gratitude journals everywhere that go along with your daily planner. There are sayings that you'll find on Facebook and in Hobby Lobby stores on wall hangings that talk about being grateful for what we already have. And it does help. But it's not a magical cure. There are going to be times when we just don't feel like being grateful when the pain of the world is too much. And that's not what this is about. It's not saying have a Pollyanna attitude and just look on the bright side. It means shifting that focus from everything that's going wrong to what is going right. Focusing on the things that already God has blessed us with. Because gratitude clears our eyes and it softens our hearts. It reminds us that we have a purpose on this earth, and our purpose is to do good on behalf of God. Thankfulness and generosity, even in times of pain and struggle, maybe especially during those times, is a testimony to God's spirit of who God is. And who God is is the most generous of givers. And we, we are the most blessed of receivers. Generosity through our time, our tithes, and our talents delights God, our creator. And even more, it shows God to others who are blessed through our generosity. Mm -hmm. And I believe we have some special music from What's his name? Ken. Ken. 
case you didn't know that, her son-in-law, Ken, has been yeah. Ted. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Ted has been uh, diagnosed with COVID, and we need prayers for him because there's a lot we still don't know about this and long-term effects. So we're glad he's not feeling completely miserable, but we still want to pray for him. Are there any others? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, what? Paul Heckenbach? Heckenbach. Heckenbach. Okay. I have a hard time hearing anyway when there's not a mass. <laughs> All right. Um, anyone else? Uh, for those of you who are on Facebook, you might have seen last week that Josh had a pretty massive flare up hit him Sunday night and Monday morning. And uh, um, I had put it on there. And I'm grateful for everyone who said prayers for him and um, blessings that it seems to, the worst of it has passed. Obviously, he's here and functioning, so I'm very grateful for prayers. And just it's a joy that even though he has to endure those, that we have medicine that can help him get through them quicker. Anything else? All right, then will you join me in an attitude of prayer? God of life and hope, we come to you today with hearts that are open. We thank you for an opportunity to hear your word, to listen to music that praises your name. We thank you that we are able to join together in fellowship and safety. Remind us of all that we have to be grateful for. It's not always a perfect life, but you never promised that, Lord. You promised to never leave us alone, and we thank you for that today. We thank you that you hear the joy and pain in our hearts even before we speak them aloud. We thank you that you answer us even when the answer isn't what we want. We thank you that before we know what our needs are, you do, and you will already start the process of providing them. We lift up to you those who are dealing with illnesses, especially Ted and Paul. We pray that you will help them heal, that you will give their doctors wisdom, and that they may find peace in knowing that you are there. We ask you to strengthen those who we haven't named, those who reside in our hearts in silence for whatever reason. We ask you to give strength to those whose names haven't popped in our heads today, that we think of later. We ask you to be with everyone who needs you, to have a soft heart and a generous spirit, so that all who call on you, whether for themselves or on behalf of others, may be heard. We thank you that you rejoice with the hopeful and a companion to the lonely. We ask that you continue to comfort all those who are weighed down with grief. And we thank you that even when you don't know others' pain, you do. Our blessings are many, Lord, and we know that. Help us remember when we forget. Help us hold your love in our hearts so that in gratitude, we may go out and be blessings to others. We pray all these things in your Son's name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing song is, Now We Think, Now Think We All Are God. to do under God and in gratitude I hope that you can go out and do that this week I hope that in the midst of our crazy world where so much is uncertain and there seems to be so much anger you can be a voice of love a voice that speaks out of the gratitude of your heart because you are made in God's image this week as you go out into the world. May God bless you and keep you today and forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.